scripture reading of God's Word today is Matthew 23, 1 through 12. Jesus said to the crowd and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sent him to Moses' seat. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you. But do not but not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for men to see they make their phylacteries <coughs> wide and their tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogue. They love to be greeted in the marketplaces and to have men call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have only one master, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor do you to be called teachers, for you have one teacher, the Christ. The greatest among you will be your servant, for whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Children's Church? Yeah. Father, we come before you today. We just are in our world that you would choose to love us. We thank you for the beauty of the sunshine that's here, the rain that is still our land. We thank you so much that the Son died for us, your Son, and gave us life that we could live abundantly on this earth and forevermore. We thank you for the Spirit who, who comes and seals us as your own child. Lord, do remind us who we are so that we can shout out who you are, that we can shout the glory and praises of our God and our King. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the Spirit. As we come to worship you today, Lord, just open up our hearts and fill us with your Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what's a phylactery? You know, we'll talk about that today. It's not a place in Wisconsin you get teased. That's a factory, right? But we'll talk about a phylactery. You did good with that, Merle. So taking pride in humility. That's kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? Did you look at your bulletins? And did you see practice what you preach? Did you notice anything about that? Practice is spelled wrong. See, we, 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 we sit here and think we do all these things. Oh, that we're doing these things right. But sometimes we just need to humble ourselves before God and say, it's not about me, it's about you. Forgive me, Father. Use me. Let me be a vessel so that I can serve you. So last week we talked about honoring our mothers. We read scripture from Mark 7. And how the Pharisees spoke the word of God. They even thought in their minds and hearts that they were doing what was best for the people, that they were, that they were telling the law of God and that they were living it. But they were maybe preaching the law of God, maybe preaching it distortedly, but they definitely weren't living it because their hearts were far from it. They had pride. They had I in the way. They didn't serve their Lord, their God, the way that they were taught. They didn't practice what they preach, as Jesus said. In fact, they had set up many traditions and stuff to protect them, to honor them. We talked about that where they set up the practice of carbon, where it's, they put their money aside for God and then wouldn't use it to take care of their own mothers and fathers. How pitiful it is when we get so caught up in our pride and self-righteousness that we are so far from the truth. And I think when we look at the Pharisees, we tend to point fingers, but if we would examine our own lives, we see so many of those same things in us if we would just simply be honest. So taking pride and humility is a, is a hard thing to do because how can you have pride and be humble at the same time? But if you take pride in God and humble yourself before Him, you can find out instead of asking Him to be greater, you say, Father, let me become less as John the Baptist said. 
And by becoming less, more of Christ will shine through you, so greater the end result will be, right? So the more that you humble yourself, the more that you will be greater. Not that you can take pride in yourself, but that you can take pride in Jesus Christ, who came and gave up heaven and died for you. <clears throat> Last week I received a few comments afterwards, and I didn't even, I told Sherry, I said, this sermon's not going to be that good or anything. But some of you said it hit you right there. And I didn't mean that. I just meant to show you an example of how Jesus loved and cared for His mother, even at the point of death. But some of you came up and said that kind of convicted me because I haven't treated my mother the way that I should have and everything. wasn't my intent, but that's what the Word of God does. It's quickening. If we'll listen and we'll be obedient to His Word, it will truly change us. That old and sinful nature will die and all things will become new. <clears throat> Maybe I should preach more about mamas. Maybe that helps. <laughs> Maybe it convicts us when we think about how we've treated our mama in the light of how Jesus set an example. But isn't that why we're supposed to read scriptures? Because the word became flesh and dwelt among us? That we can see God through Jesus Christ, through his words, through his actions? It shouldn't surprise us that on the cross, still on the cross, he was trying to save people to the last minute. He was telling the thief that today you'll be with me in paradise because you have repented and believed. And he was also worried about who was going to take care of his mother. He wasn't worried. He knew. But he was concerned. He had compassion. Because God gave him Mary as his mother to be a special part of his life. And up to the very end, Jesus was living the example that he taught. So why would it surprise us? Jesus gave his final teachings... If you remember back in John 13 when he set the example by washing the disciples' feet. And he said, as I have done for you, do for others. He set that example of humble servitude. Something that was even degrading. That no one wanted to do at that time. But he said, this is what I tell you to do. To be a humble servant. And then in John chapter 14, he says he's going to leave. To go to prepare a place for us. Woo, how wonderful. And he tells us that so that we won't be disheartened or saddened. Because we see the outcome, the end result of our faith. That we're going to get to spend forever in heaven in the place that Jesus has prepared for us. That we'll be with God our Father forever and ever and ever. So we shouldn't even worry about this world, but long to live for that day. Everything should be based on that what we do. Not to build up treasures in this earth, but to look forward to what we have built up for us in heaven. But Thomas says, how can we know? We don't even know where you're going. How can we know the way? So when Jesus says in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And you've heard that a million times probably. But by me. There is no other way. There is no other power but Jesus. He's the one that changed everything. He's the one that opened us up back to a right relationship with God if we would simply believe. He is the one that made it possible. He is the one that can change us from the inside out by the power of the Spirit. The Spirit reveals to us the very Word of God, which is Jesus. Jesus became flesh and walked among us. So we can't forget that it's but by Jesus. No other way is possible. There is no other way, no other truth, and no other life. Jesus is the way. We try to come up with so many other ways. I hear so many Christians say, I hope that I am good enough to make it to heaven. <laughs> but you're not. You're far from it. You have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard. But because God loved you, He sent Jesus who did accomplish that. So He is the only way. If you're banking on being good enough, you're going to fall way, way short. But... By the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ, we will be His brothers. We will have eternity in heaven if we simply believe. Is there anybody that's too awful, too mean, too nasty, too sinful? No, because Jesus paid the price again. His sacrifice was accepted by God. He rose from the dead, giving us hope like we can never, ever imagine. That we are the children of God. So we can shout to the north and the south, right? We need to remind each other who we are and the glorious position we are in. We are 
children, sons and daughters of God Almighty. Woo! Right? So Jesus is the way. He is the truth, and the truth will set you free, right? And He is life. Life to live now and to live forever and ever and ever. Jesus is the way. He lived an example for us to follow. He taught the words for us to follow. So why do we pick and choose what teachings we want to follow? Why are we surprised at His example on the cross and it penetrates our, our heart and soul? We should have expected everything that Jesus did because He lived out the words that He preached. He was a humble servant that gave up heaven to come to earth. And we can take pride in His accomplishments, but we've got to humble ourselves also and face whatever God calls us to face in life. If it faced having a mother that was a good mother or facing having a mother that was a bad mother, whatever it is, to face disease, to face turmoil, to face wealth, to face poverty, whatever the things are, that we will be content with what God has given us and that we will shine like Jesus Christ because we believe and live Jesus Christ through the power of His Spirit. That means we have to die to ourselves. We have to humble ourselves. And that's such a hard thing to do because we are prideful people. We want what we want, not necessarily what God wants. So Jesus' example on the cross convicts us. We see truly everything that He's taught to the very end. But it amazes us that He could do that because we can't do that. But we can through the power of the Spirit. That's why I'll keep reminding you that John said, if you sin, because you don't have to. You have the power of God inside you. You've just got to empty yourself of the unholy trinity. Do you know what that is? Me, myself, and I, right? And fill yourself with the trinity, with the power of God. To know God through Jesus Christ our Lord. To understand scriptures through the power of the Spirit. To be obedient to give up yourselves and to live a life full of Christ. And Jesus, we learned about that, has already warned us that you can't empty out that house of all the terrible things, all the demons in your life, all the sins, and not fill it back up completely with Jesus. Because you're just asking for trouble. But if you're full of Jesus through the power of the Spirit, then Satan has no power over you whatsoever. You can live a life that brings glory and honor to God. But don't beat up yourself if you fall. Just get back up. Ask for forgiveness. Turn to Him for your power and strength. And you know what? He'll give it to you. He'll forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Because that's what He says and we can believe every word. Don't point fingers though. We need to practice that as well, don't we? Because it's so easy to catch up and see others fall. And guess what? When you're doing that, you're just as guilty, aren't you? You're doing the exact same things, but a different type of sin. It's no different. You're no different than the ones that you're pointing fingers of. Instead, we need to love them. It's amazing that John was picked to be the one that took care of Mary, to be his son. Because John was not a shining example of love. But if you look in his scriptures, he teaches love, love, love. Love covers a multitude of sins. That we should love one another as Christ loves us. He was there at the, at the cross. Maybe He was the only one that Jesus saw, right? That's why I picked Him? I don't think that's it. Do you? Why was He there? Because He had a heart and compassion for God. Surely John must have been accepted by Jesus because he had such godly behavior. And that's why he picked Him to take care of Mary, right? <laughs> no. It wasn't because of His godly behavior. I'll give you a couple examples. John was the one who asked Jesus if he wanted to rain down fire from heaven on the Samaritans to destroy them and wipe them out because he hated the half-breeds. That doesn't sound anything like Jesus' teaching, does it? In Luke 9, verses 51 to 55, we read, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into, some, into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was headed for Jerusalem. He wasn't going to do any of the wonderful miracles and signs. He wasn't going to give them what they wanted. So they had no need for him. When the disciples James and John saw this, 
They asked the Lord, Do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. I, I find that passage amazing. First of all, why would I have the power or authority to call down fire from heaven? Who do I think that I am? But this is what John thought. After three years of traveling with Jesus, who am I? I am someone because I'm traveling with Jesus. I'll call down fire from heaven and destroy them. But Jesus came to save, to heal, to set people free. And John had no clue of this at that point, did he? Well, I'll give you another example. It was just prior to that. In Luke 9, 46 through 48, it reads, An argument started among the disciples as to which of them would be the greatest. Jesus, knowing their thoughts, took a little child and had him stand beside him. Then he said to them, Whoever welcomes this little child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. For it is the one who is the least among you, all who is the greatest. This is just before the verses where he wants to rain down fire from heaven. John and James are arguing with the rest of the disciples over who's going to be the greatest. Do you see that pride? Do you see that they can't see the truth? We're not just talking about the Pharisees. We're not talking about the crowds, but we're talking about the disciples that walked and talked with Jesus, who saw all the miraculous proofs, gave up their life to follow after this rabbi, this teacher, this master, the Messiah, the Son of God, and they're still arguing because they can't get rid of that unholy trinity. They can't get rid of that pride. It's still about me rather than about God. And, and that stands true today. It stands true in my life. I want what I want. God created this beautiful world for me to enjoy, and I have to humble myself before Him and say that you, God, reign, not me. Take me off the throne. And you get back on the throne, whatever you need to do to humble me. And He loves us. He does want the best for us. But He also wants us to fulfill the mission that He has for us, to be ambassadors to the world, to be the salt bringing preservative and flavor, to be the light so that darkness can be stifled out, so that all may see the glory and riches of our Father in heaven. <clears throat> In Jesus' first teachings, John had heard this message. Luke chapter 6, verse 37 through 42. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Wasn't he doing that when he was calling down fire? Do not condemn. Wasn't he doing that? And you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. I don't think he was very forgiving, was he? Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So was he calling raining down fire upon himself? This was Jesus' first teaching years ago. And they haven't absorbed very far, have they? Verse 39, he also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Isn't that the purpose? Is to be trained up to be like their master? So that they could teach the master's teachings? So that they could follow in his footsteps? But how can they if they're so blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. So that's what John was like that day that Jesus died on the cross, wasn't it? He was like Jesus. No, he was far from like Jesus because he hadn't submitted himself. He hadn't given up that prideful nature. He was still there at least. He was there with the women. He was there watching his Lord. He didn't know what to do. He had no idea. And that power of the resurrection, which we know, gives us the hope that He didn't have at that time. That we know when Jesus died, it wasn't over. It was just the beginning. Because He defeated death. He defeated sin. He defeated Satan's hold on us. And now we have an obligation to tell the world the truth because of how much God loved us that He would sacrifice His only Son to die for us. And that that... That sacrifice was accepted by God. And He rose Jesus again on the third day, giving us hope and life as children of God. Verse 41 reads, Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. 
First take the plank out of your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck out of your brother's eye. So I think John was still a hypocrite, wasn't he? We like to point fingers at those Pharisees and say, hmm, look at you. But the disciples wore a mask just the same because they didn't truly give their heart to Jesus. Maybe they didn't understand everything. Maybe they did. Maybe they just had eye in the way. I'll follow Jesus in everything as long as it doesn't cost me too much. But Jesus was clear about that too. He told us to figure the cost. No matter what, I talked a little bit about that before with a penny and the investment in that. But no matter what the cost is, the reward in heaven far outweighs any cost you can ever have in your life. Look at some examples like Joni Erickson and other people that you have that have a catastrophe happen in their life and bound, binds them to a wheelchair and everything. And they still praise God in everything they do. They know that by what happened to them, the pain and suffering in this world, that they are a better light and example because they can go on to preach how much God loves them even in their trials and pain and affliction. They know that the reward that they get in heaven far outweighs any cost. John hadn't figured this out yet, but he would because he becomes the apostle of love. But at Jesus' death, it wasn't because of what John was that Jesus picked him to take care of his mama. It was because of what he would be in Christ by the power of his spirit, by letting go and letting the spirit of God use him, by becoming an empty vessel, which meant he had to empty himself out of, him, out of I first. So he wasn't the only one there. He wasn't perfect, but he was a new creation in Christ because he had faith, he believed. And Jesus saw that. And he gave him the responsibility of taking care of his mother. John MacArthur says this about the disciple of love. It is remarkable that John is nicknamed the apostle of love. Indeed, he wrote more than any other New Testament author about the importance of love, laying particular stress on the Christian's love for Christ, Christ's love for his church, and the love for one another that is the hallmark of true believers. The theme of love flows through his writings, but love was a quality he learned from Christ, not something that came naturally to him. And it's not something that comes naturally to us. It's something that we have to do through humble, submissive obedience. But I want to contradict John MacArthur. And maybe he'll see this and call me. I don't know. I don't think it's remarkable again, because I don't think it was remarkable that Jesus told people up to the very last minute, if you believe in me, you will spend forever in paradise. I don't think it's remarkable that he found someone to take care of his mother as, his, as he was dying. I don't think it's remarkable that he said to the Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And the reason I say that is we have to look at the definition of, re of remarkable. It does mean worthy of attention, okay? Striking. So that part of the definition is okay. But if we go deeper, here are some of the, the synonyms for remarkable. Extraordinary. That means it's out of the ordinary. Well, it is as far as we're concerned, but it's not out of the ordinary for God, is it? It's not out of the ordinary for God to love. It's not out of the ordinary for God to make something out of something that's not and make something that's great. Not for my own pride and prejudice, but so that I can be a light to the world. <clears throat> exceptional. It is exceptional. But it is not the exception for those believers who truly believe in the power of the Spirit to be transformed, is it? It's something that's supposed to be. So it's not out of the ordinary. It's something that is ordinary if you'll just realize that. We're studying 12 ordinary men, the disciples, who changed the world and grew the church because they believed in the power of God. They had faith and they walked by faith, not by sight. By the power of the living God that resides in, in them. Amazing. That's causing great surprise. Well, it is amazing, but it shouldn't surprise us again. Because Jesus did exactly what He taught. Exactly what He came for. In humble submission, He gave up heaven to be the light to this world, to bring salvation to men, to die in the place of us for our sins. Incredible. That means it's impossible to believe. <laughs> it's not impossible to believe for believers. The world looks at us and says we're foolish. Jesus freaks. But it's not impossible for us at all because we know that it's made, made possible 
by the power of God's Spirit. Marvelous, causing great wonder and extremely pleasing. Oh, it is extremely pleasing. And it causes great wonder. Yes, but we don't have to wonder about it because we have peace that surpasses all understanding. Faith that brings about all hope. Hope that is not only something we desire, but something that's concrete that no one can change. God is in control and He loves His children. Momentous. A, an event or change of great importance or significance, especially in the bearing on the future. You better believe that one because your future is at stake. It is remarkable, but it's not remarkable, that John, the one who wanted to rain fire down from heaven, who wanted to be the greatest, would tell us to love one another, who would have compassion, who would be the one that Jesus said, take care of my mama. Because he submitted to the power of God. He humbled himself and got rid of that pride that kept him from being the man of God that he had been called to be. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And somewhere along the way, John caught that. And it forever changed him. And if you catch that, it can forever change you. And God can use you for the great and wonderful things that He has planned for you. But you may not experience that if you don't. If John would not have realized that, we wouldn't call him the apostle of love today. We wouldn't have the letters that he wrote. We wouldn't have his example to take in Jesus' mother and provide and care for her. The scripture says from that day on, he took into her, her, him, her into his own home as his own mother and loved and cared for her. The difference is John believed. John repented of his thinkings and humbled himself before God, getting rid of that pride and arrogance, taking that mask off and laying it at Jesus' feet and saying, here's all my sin and shame. Take me, use me, fill me. That brings me to the scripture this morning from Matthew 23, verses 1 through 12. Then Jesus said to the crowds, maybe you notice that, but first he's talking to the crowds. This really is the end of his public ministry. He started out his ministry with the Sermon on the Mount that we have recorded as far as teachings. And he said some of the same things. We talked about that earlier, about humbling ourselves. And he gave warnings about hypocrisy back in the very beginning of his teachings. And now he's wrapping up that teaching to the, to the crowds. He will spend some more personal time with the disciples, but this was the, really his last message to crowds. And he tells them, and to his disciples, he says, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. They're in the position to teach the law. They have the authority to do that. So you must be careful to do everything that they tell you because you're obeying the commands of God. But do not do what they do because they're hypocrites. They preach one thing, but they don't practice it. For they do not practice what they preach. And that little thing we said this morning doesn't even have the word spelled right because we get caught up in our own conceit and vanity. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. There's no compassion, no brotherly love. Everything they do is done for people to see. They say they serve the Lord, but it's really so that I can be prideful and vain, right? They're not worried about people. They're worried about how they look, righteous in the eyes of God. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads so that other people can't necessarily follow them. They put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger for them, for them to move them from them. They don't care about other people. They tell the laws to restrain you and burden you to where I can't do it, to where I can't feel the worth that I am as a child of God, to where I have these thoughts and deceptions from the devil that I'll never be good enough for heaven. When the truth is, Jesus was, so therefore I am if I simply believe. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. Okay, what that is is their box of prayers that are put on their wrist or arm or put on their forehead. And they make them big so that you can see them. I don't only carry God's prayers and commandments around, but mine are bigger than yours. Got it? And the hem on my robe is bigger than yours so you can see mine. I don't know if you watch Star Trek much. Did you do Star Trek, Bob? But the 
they had the little things on their sleeves that represented what status they were. If you had four of them on, you were captain, right? But if you just had one or two, and if you had one and had a red shirt, you were probably in that episode only, and you'd be killed that day, right? <laughs> so they wanted people to see them. They wanted to be proud of their righteousness. Verse 6, they love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and to be called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. Brothers of Jesus. Wow. And not to call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. John finally figured that out. And when he figured that out, I'm sure he didn't care about being great anymore. He just cared about honor and bringing glory to God. Verse 12, For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Do what the Pharisees teach. Obey God's Word. But don't have it be a restriction to others. Don't point fingers at others because they're not. But let it be a light. Love as Jesus loved. To the very end, telling people about salvation through Jesus Christ. Loving your mama and your father and giving them the praise and honor that they deserve as who God put in your life as your parents. Be thankful for them in all circumstances. Show them Christ's love so that they may see Christ through you. Get rid of that unholy trinity. Get rid of that pride. Jesus will take it all. Fill yourself completely with Him through the power of the Spirit. Live a life of worth. <clears throat> Serve God to your potential. Not to your potential that you have, but through the potential that lives in you through Christ Jesus. So what stops a Christian, I said it earlier, from being like Christ? That's what the definition means. If you'll be honest, most of the time it's pride. I don't want to do this today. I'll do this when. I, 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 I just need this vice. I, I don't really like him, so send me to someone else to witness. I, I'll do it after I go to the lake because I really want to go to the lake today. It's sun shining. I got a million excuses today. Whatever it may be, pride stands in the way. If you're honest. So we've got to get rid of that and empty that so that we can serve God. To realize He is the creator of everything. He chose to create you. If I created and designed this pen and it didn't write, I'd throw it away, right? You've done that many times with pens. It'd be frustrating because that pen was supposed to write what I had designed it to do. And God designed us to be a light to this world. He even pursued you passionately and had His Son give up heaven to come down and die in your place. So why would I worry about my pride and my vanity? But why wouldn't I praise God and thank Him for what He's done in my life? The Pharisees knew the law. They knew what Leviticus had to say. They knew the punishment for disobedience. The Pharisees taught that law. And in Leviticus, if you want to read chapter 26, I'm not going to go through it now, but it tells about all the things that we're supposed to do and all the promises. And then it goes into the things that are disobedient. But if you look at the last part of Leviticus 26, verses 40 to 42, but if they will confess their sins. That's all you got to do. That's it. No big, you know, rammer roll or whatever you got to do. You got to simply say, Father, forgive me. As Jesus said for us, because He said they don't know what they're doing. But if you read God's Word, you do know what you're doing. You're without excuse. Jesus gave example after example after example. Not just to the Pharisees, not just to the crowds, but to His own disciples. Have you got to change that way of thinking? And they did. But we've got to do the same thing if we want to pattern our lives after and imitate them, as Paul says, to imitate his behavior. Who said, I'm content in whatever circumstance that I have. And his life showed that. And he was used... Wow for God. Just so amazingly. If they will confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors, their unfaithfulness and their hostility towards me, which made me hostile towards them, 
so that I sent them into the land of their enemies. Then when their uncircumcised hearts are humbled, the exact opposite of pride, and they pay for their sins, I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember their land. See, pride is a terrible thing if you're taking pride in yourself, but it doesn't have to be a, a bad thing. We should have pride in our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ for what He did for us. <clears throat> So we're going to go next week into that wicked servant, that man, who took so much pride in himself. He said, all the things that I have on this earth are because of me, myself, and I. And that same night, Jesus requires his life of him. Jesus has already taught us in Luke 12, verse 1, says, Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. In verse 15, he says, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life doesn't consist in abundance of possessions. And we talked about our prideful nature today. A life of humble service is what Jesus is telling his disciples in these final, and final days that he's calling them to be. To take pride in humility, to live for God rather than yourself. Philippians 2 1 through 8, I want to say in closing. Think about it meditate on these scriptures. Therefore, because of all that God has done for you, the love of Christ, the example He set, the love that He had for His mama, all of those things, if you have any encouragement, any, from being united with Christ, any comfort at all from His love, any common sharing in the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then... Make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or out of vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not some. Value others above yourself. Not looking to your own interests, but the complete opposite, each of you to the interest of others. You come to church to serve, not to be served. You come to church to learn what God's Word is so that you can go out and live that life. <clears throat> In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Look at those examples that we gave last week. Who being in, the very being in very nature God, He was God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for His own advantage. He gave it all up. He humbled Himself completely. He made Himself nothing by taking the very nature of what? A servant. Being made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance of man, He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to death, even the death on the cross. So if it convicted you about how Jesus loved His mom and had compassion for her, then what do these words do for you? We're supposed to pattern ourselves after Christ to imitate His behavior, to love one another above ourselves. That's what God has called us to be as Christians if we're going to be like Christ. Father, I do thank You and praise You for the flesh of Jesus, that He came and became flesh and died for our sins in our place. I thank You that His death was sufficient, that it paid the price of sin for everyone who would choose to believe. I thank You for the love that You have, the mercy that You gave us instead of giving us the punishment that we deserve, and the grace that You just poured out upon us by bringing us into your very own, adopting us into your home forevermore. Remind us who we are, Father, that we are children of God, children of the Most High, that we are brothers of Christ, that we have the example and the words that He taught, that it shouldn't be a wonder to us that He behaved the way He did, but we should pattern our lives after Him, knowing that we can't do it on our own, but that You've given us everything we need, that Jesus didn't leave us as orphans, but instead... He asks you to send the Spirit to seal us as your very own 
to empower us, to heal us, to comfort us, and I could go on and on. We just thank you for that love and the power that you've given to us. Help empty us of ourselves. Take our pride and our vanity. Father, as we're willing to give it to you, use us to be more like John, to be an ambassador to this world. We just thank you and praise you for you deserve all praise and honor. We thank you for the Lamb who humbled himself and gave himself for us. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.